Hello everyone, welcome to another video from the AI Loop. Today we're going to be looking at Tarcoder, an open source LLM for code generation and other tasks related to code. So let's get started. Well, to start off, let's start off by looking at the variants offered by the Tarcoder. So there are two variants offered by the Tarcoder. The first one is the base model, that's the Tarcoder base. And the second one is named the star coder itself. And I'm going to talk about the difference between these two models. Well, to start off, both of the models consists of 15.5 billion parameters. I think that's a pretty good job considering the size of the language model recently has been shooting to 60 or 70 billion. And the difference between these two variants is that the base one is trained on 86 programming languages that includes Python and the second version, the star coder, is fine-tuned or is an upgraded version of the base version and is fine-tuned and an additional 35 billion Python tokens. So that is very good at generating code related to Python and for the star coder base, I think it's around 1 trillion tokens, the training set. So it's a very big training set that they have used to train this model. Now let's dig into the paper more and understand the various aspects used in the training. So let's start off by understanding the data part of it, of how the data was processed and what are the things that they did to ensure the quality of the data. So to start off, the data set that they used is called the stack and this is from the big code community, I guess. Yeah, it is from the big code community and it consists of around 385 programming languages and the stack data set consists of various repositories so each repository holds its own license so and it's open source so you could use it actually for your own tasks but you have to abide by the licenses uh, mentioned in the repository. So Starcoder used this data set and they've done some filtering through the data set, actually a lot of filtering through the data set and ended up with 86 programming languages at the end. So to start off, I really want to say we do not really need data intensive uh, code base, right? Like let's say we have files like YAML or XML or json files usually these files or let's say even the dot pickle files let's say these files are usually uh used in holding the configurations or data part of it so they've reduced these files or the size of it i think the main criteria was like the number of tokens or number of lines like they only considered files with less than 100 lines of code in these files so even before this there has been like multiple filterings that have happened so the first criteria is that they've considered data extensions or like let's say programming languages they've considered programming languages which have a minimum of 500 mb of data in the three out of the 385 programming languages and also like languages that are in the top 50 for the GitHub, like top 50 programming languages according to GitHub. So that's the uh, criteria that they've considered to filter out the data set right from 385 programming languages. Well, after this initial filtration, what they've did to ensure the quality of the data set is they've done a visual inspection manually. And the way they've done that is, it's very interesting because uh, this really ensures that the quality of the data set is really high and uh, helps the model generate good quality code. So what they've done is they've randomly picked 30,000 samples, like sample files from their training set, like from their data set, and they've categorized them according to the programming languages. Because when I say uh, file extensions or programming languages, they're like same thing in this context. So they've categorized them according to different programming languages and kept a maximum of 1000 files for every programming language. So anything over that, they just took it off or cut it off. And these files are then just sent for manual inspection. I think they took the help of Big Code community to manually inspect for, I think, aspects like automated code generation or anything that is, does not really contain quality code. So this way they ensure that the 
code quality or the data set that they're taking is really good. One more thing to note is that the Jupyter notebooks are also converted into Python scripts, sorry, whatever language it is, those scripts. So they've used some software for this and converted all the notebooks to these scripts. And along with this, there are two other aspects. So we have the code right now, but I think as a conversational agent or in order to establish a relation between the natural language and code, it is really important to have data of that sort. So they've considered data from GitHub issues and the pull requests. So what really happens is that in issues and pull requests, you usually explain about the code or give a description of the changes that you've made in the code. This really helps the model establish a relation between natural language and the way it is talked about in the programming language. So this is what they've considered for that part. And they also considered the commit messages data set where they used GitHub commit messages, like the code before the commit and the code after the commit and the commit message itself. So that is it for the data part. But yeah, one more thing to note is that when they did sample all of this, what really happened is that they've observed an uneven distribution, like some programming languages were really high in number and they didn't really want to oversample the underrepresented programming languages because of the basic intuition that if a programming language is high in number, that means it's obviously popular. And if the model really learns more of that, it would be helpful for the community. So that was the intuition behind not really disturbing the sample of the, like the distribution of the programming languages that they had. Well, one good uh, initiative from this is that as a PII reduction, I think that that's when elaborated is called personal identity information. Sorry if I pronounced it wrong, but that that's the way they ensure that all the private data or the variables or information that is private is not passed into the training set. So I'll just wrap this up in a bit. So the thing is they've, con they've collected 12,000 data points, which consists of like uh, the sensitive information. Sensitive information could be anything such as email address or IP address or passwords or usernames. And they've collected uh, data points based on this. I think there were around six classes of sensitive information and they've made uh, annotators manually annotate the type of sensitive information that they found in each file. And basically now you have like a data set that maps from uh, code to the sensitive information that's in there. So let's say three classes are in there. So this really helped them train an encoder model that really, so the encoder model they've trained is uh, pre-trained on the mass language modeling and next sentence prediction. So it's similar to BERT. And what they've done is when you give a piece of code here, since they already have the training set, it's been pre-trained on mass language modeling and the next sentence prediction. When you give like a piece of code here, we extract the CLS token on the starting point, right? And they just put like a linear layer over the CLS token to get the output. And this is, I think, passed over as softmax. Yeah, that, that should be the case. Ideally, it's passed over as softmax to predict the class of the sensitive information. And basically, they just masked it. So let's say we have email ID in our code. And what they did is replace with with the keyword email. Similarly, for the word password, so like for the passwords, they should have been replaced with the token password, this this one specifically. And this, uh, it is similar. Now let us get into the model training. The model training itself is not really a big deal in this model, but there are like an in interesting things to observe. Well, there's only one pre-training objective. That's the fill in the middle. So I'm going to elaborate a bit on the fill in the middle training objective. So what really happens is that I really, let's say I have, and let's, let's consider natural language, right? Let's say I have this sentence, like I'm here. You usually mask a word like this, and then like you ask the model to predict it. And this, this becomes very easy, like not very easy, but like not so tricky for the model to 
answer but what makes it tricky is that when you have some context in the start and you have some context in the end and let's say as a human do if you're asked to predict something that falls in between the start context and the end context it really becomes tricky because the things that you say in here has to hook on to the start and also to the end and this is basically the fill in the middle objective i'll put out some examples of how the data was arranged or like the way data was processed to be passed into the model right here so this way the model training is done and it's a fill in the middle objective is proven to be effective let me know in the comments if you want me to make in videos about pre-training objectives and how they work so let's just look at the model architecture the model architecture is again a decoder only architecture that means it's given an input it's asked to predict the next word and then it happens over and over again until you reach the end of sentence talking or the maximum length so that's pretty much it for the model training two aspects to note is that they've used multi-query attention and flash attention well flash attention is just for speeding up the, the process of uh, attention cal value calculations but uh, it, it, it was interesting for me to explore this multi-query attention because i've never heard of this concept before reading this paper and i just went into a brief overview and understood that multi-query attention is same as the normal multi-headed attention but the only difference is that in multi-headed attention we have different queries for different heads right in here we have different heads sharing the same key and value vectors so this really becomes uh, convenient with the memory requirements as we increase the number of heads try to gain an intuition on that paper but do let me know if you find that interesting or anything about the multi-query attention in the comment section well that's pretty much it uh, there are a couple of aspects that i wanted to focus on that when the model has been trained on like the tokenizer that was used is the byte pair encoding this is a fairly general concept uh, that's used so it was trained on byte pair encoding and apart from that if you look through the paper there are very interesting aspects that are laid out one thing is that they've given the impactness of the model and the information on using the model as a technical assistant or the pre-training templates that they've used or the toxicity of the content that is generated by the model these are interesting evaluations and would be great to know but would make this a very long video if i cover them and the last one about evaluations is that this model outperforms all the open source large language models and also goes on par with uh, code Cushman and even outperforms it in some case and not really getting into evaluations because they're just a bunch of numbers that you have to understand and intuitively make sense out of it so this is it regarding the star coder i hope you like the video please subscribe to the air loop that would mean a lot to our hard work and i'll see you in the next video